Okay, well, here we are. Um, there's going to be no modeling in this video, but there will be talk about modeling. <laughs> I'm I'm uh, I'm having all kinds of system issues here, and I don't know um, why. So anyway, um, so I got to be down here, and I got to clean this bench off a little bit so that I can work. But in that process, I wanted to take some time and one talk about uh, moving forward here. Uh, from this point forward and um of course the monthly contest and uh some things that brett brought up on his channel over there brett g um so yeah so i'll talk about that and while i'm cleaning up here and uh this is the mess I got to deal with right now. Get my phone out of here. I don't know. Um, how things get like this, but <laughs> anyway, I'm going to put this down here. Okay. Um, oh, let's see. First things first, I guess. So as far as the Shutter Ace channel, the plan is we are going to, um, starting immediately, concentrate on monogram stuff. Um, and there's a couple of reasons why. Um, one of the biggest is, is because that's what I enjoy, um, personally, myself. And uh, that's a big reason. <laughs> I don't know if I need another reason. <clears throat> but um, the other po point is that uh, there is very little um, well done content on the old monogram stuff on YouTube. You see this? You see this? So, what happened? Well, um, as some of you probably use your workspace for other things, like I do, um, I've got CDs being ripped and, and software CDs being ripped and stored on a hard drive, and, and I've got um, photos that people want scans of friends and family. Um, so I'm dealing with all of that uh, in here. And um, basically a pile of books fell over on this thing. So, and I'm, I'm, and this is the one I had to cut the barrels off of. So I'm not, uh, this one's not a priority is what I'm saying. So it goes back in its shoe box. Remember my shoe boxes? One dollar. One dollar shoe boxes. They were great. Um so what we're gonna do here is this the channel, the YouTube channel, is going to concentrate on monogram stuff vintage vintage stuff in general but a lot of it's going to be monogram stuff um, and like i said the reason being is i don't think there's a whole lot of uh from what i've been able to find there's not a whole lot of quality content out there on the old monogram kits and there's still a lot of us that like to build them there's a zillion guys out there building, the, doing the um, the new high end stuff, and I don't know that we need somebody else out there talking about that stuff. It's uh, 
Now, like I said, it's all over. Everybody's doing it. So what's the point of having somebody else do it, right? So that's my thinking. That's where I'm... So that's, uh, that's the plan there. Um, the first thing up is going to be... Do I have it in here or not? I got a bunch of stuff I'm selling too. So I got... Uh, it's going to be the Monogram P61 Black Widow. As a matter of fact, I have the P61. Okay. I have an original boxing I'm building. This, however, is this month's raffle prize. Um, so this is a... Oh, what year is this? A 91 or something? 1991 boxing of the Monogram P61. Um, so there is a buddy build going over, going on over at the $20 Modelers Club on Facebook. It's not a contest. It's just a buddy build, a bunch of people building the same kit. It goes on until February. The drawing for this one will be the beginning of January. Plenty of time. If you want to get involved in that and you need a kit, I'll send that to you. If you win, how do you how do you enter? Um, same drill as always. Send me a photo of your latest completed build. Um, be aware that it will be shown on the YouTube video where the winner is announced. And um, your name goes in the hat. We hit the random number generator and boom. Somebody gets it. And I throw in the mail and it comes to your house. How cool is that? So, that said, enter. Enter the contest. It's free. It costs you nothing. It costs you a photograph on YouTube. That's what it costs you. No big deal. Um, so anyway, moving on. So I was talking about Brett G earlier, and Brett is a fellow YouTuber modeler guy. And um, anyway, he... Uh, He put up a video this morning where he was talking about um, detail and colors and and all of that stuff, you know, and and how that all fits in to your worldview, I guess, for lack of a better way of putting it. So. Um, And I think I've made my position pretty clear on this stuff, but I figured I would go through it again for a little while um, just because uh, I, I got to, uh, you know, I got to work with this mess anyway. I might as well um, make some content while I'm at it, <laughs> I guess is my thought. I don't know. So... I guess let me start out in general saying you know there's there's a bunch of generalities that we could say and I'm going to deal mainly with World War II here um, but there are you will see people um, you know make these claims that you know it was wartime they were building planes like crazy there really were no rules uh, I don't buy that for a minute. In a combat zone, yes. In a factory here in the U.S., where they're turning out thirty thousand aircraft a year or whatever, I'm not. I'm not even going to entertain that thought. And I will tell you why. Um, if you've worked in a production environment, in a, in a um, production line environment, I should say, and I have a little bit. I'm not, I'm not uh, 
a lifelong production line guy. So um, give me some grace here, I guess. <laughs> but um, there are procedures. And everything that happens in an assembly plant like that, there's a procedure for. And everything is procedural. Um, so that you can keep putting out the same exact product every single time. Okay, notice I didn't say a perfect product or a flaw-free product or whatever. I said the same product every single time. Sometimes that means the same piece of junk every single time. But that's a discussion for another day. <laughs> so here's what I'm going to say. Yes, World War II was 70 years ago. But that does not mean they were Neanderthals and they were just throwing crap together because that's not way the that's not the way that mass production works. Period. So, if you um, want to, so the reason that's important is you can't. You know, you'll see these things that you'll you'll see things where, oh, you know. One plane would be one color or one shade, and then the very next plane on the assembly line is going to be a different shade, and the one after that's going to be a different shade, because they just got all this different paint from all these different paint factories, and and blah 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 blah. And I haven't actually seen any photographic evidence of that. We'll get to that whole thing in a while, but but um, the fact of the matter is, if you're building a crap ton of stuff at one time and you got to paint it all. You're not walking around the plant with a one-gallon can of paint and a paintbrush. That's not what's happening, <laughs> right? You're you're going to have these vats of paint, and you're going to just mix all that stuff together. So you're still going to end up with one color. You know, are you going to end up with different shades or tones or whatever from batch to batch? Absolutely. Absolutely, I'm not arguing that at all. But the idea that this plane, that, that the plane that you're working on is going to be a different shade or tone than the plane ahead of you on the assembly line and the plane directly behind you on the assembly line and every single plane on that assembly line, is just, it's just going to be this random, you know, these random tones and shades all next to each other in the assembly building is... I don't see that happening. I could be wrong, but I don't see that happening. Not not in the way that I've seen things work on a production floor. Um, and even if you painted a house or anything, you know if you're using multiple cans of paint in order to make sure everything's the same, you mix all your cans. If, if it's going to take you three gallons of paint to paint a room, you don't open up one gallon in paint and then, and then open up the second gallon when you run out. That's not what you do. You get a five-gallon bucket, you dump all three gallons in there, and you mix it all together so it's all the same color. That's how that works. And there's no reason to believe that they would do any differently in a factory situation where they're, who knows how much, you know, how much paint they're going through or how much anti-corrosive zinc chrome that they're going through or whatever. Right. So um, that would be my first thing that I would say is, is just because, you know, we're talking 70 years ago doesn't mean they were working in wood huts. Right. You know what I'm saying? Um, you know, the, uh, the Industrial Revolution started what? The, the late 1800s. Uh, it's it's not. Um, crazy to think that, that they were doing some pretty sophisticated stuff in the 40s. I mean, look at what they were doing in the, in the 30s and, and even at the turn of the century. I mean, there are machines in factories in this country that are 120, 130, 140 years old and are still out there making stuff. They're still producing in factories and, and all over this country. And you may think that's a bunch of crap, but it's not. It's absolutely true. Um, 
So anyway, just because everything that we buy nowadays falls apart in five years, doesn't mean it was always that way. <laughs> Again, different discussion. Um, so that was the end of the coffee. The next point would be Well, I guess two, I guess there's, I don't know if these are the same thing or not. Same idea. We'll put it, we'll lump them together. One, knowledge changes over time. Um, and if you know, um, there's various subjects you can pick that are constantly in flux, especially in the scientific community where where things are, you know, the knowledge bubble is growing and growing and growing and growing and growing. So theories change and, and ideas change and facts change. Or things that, that we thought were facts, we find out weren't facts. And so, right, you know what I'm saying? That, that, that knowledge changes all the time. What you know today added to what you will know tomorrow will bring you, may bring you to a different conclusion than where you're at right now. That's so as long as there's more information out there, you can't really say that something's definitive is what I'm getting at. And the next thing that ties right into that is a single source document is not a definitive thing. Um, now, there's two sides to this. You know, there's, hey, this is the only picture we got. So we have to assume this is right. No, and, and to get off on a tangent, but that's kind of, I was, back in college, I was interested in anthropology and and whatnot, and um, in archaeology, mainly anthropology, but, um, and I always had a problem with the idea that, you know, you find one little artifact or whatever in some area, and you draw all these conclusions and and the next thing you know, you know, you you find a piece of a femur, and the next thing you know, you have a whole animal drawn up on a piece of paper, and it's like, what? <laughs> How does that even work? Um, you know, it's like finding a, a 10 millimeter nut laying in a dirt field in Germany, and 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 somehow extrapolating that into a Volkswagen. Uh, anyway. <laughs> In my head, anyway. So, uh, so the same thing applies here. Obviously, in my head is is that um, yeah, there there's a single source is not definitive in any way, shape, or form. And I don't know that you ever end up with enough sources to where it's definitive. But but that's you know, the more sources you have the better off you are. Now, now there are modelers out there that will that, that are into um, duplicating photographs, and that's fine, and that's great. But even when you do something with that, you can only see one side of the object. So if it's got a, a paint pattern on it or something on it, um, you don't know what the other side actually looks like, you're guessing, okay? So something to be aware of is, is we don't have perfect knowledge on this stuff. Um, so with that, all that in mind, um, where does that put us as modelers? I guess is, is, it would be the next thing. So in my head, there's two types of modelers, maybe three. You have builders um, who just like to build kits, who like to do fit and stuff and fit parts together and glue them together. And, and uh, that's what they like to do. Um, you have painters who really don't care about building the model, but they really enjoy the painting process and the weathering process and all that. Um, and then you have researchers 
Uh, and I would put researchers really into super detailers, I guess. Um, so they're like a, an Uber builder or something, a scratch builder or, or whatever. So, um, and I would say that we're all, all builders, all modelers are in, we're part, we're, we have all three of these things in us, but I think each one of us tends to gravitate toward one in particular. Um, I'm not much of a super detailer myself, um, and we'll get to that in a bit, but I'm definitely a builder probably more than I am a painter because I don't always finish things. Um, but I do like the painting process. It's not that I don't. Um, it, the painting process can be very rewarding, but I'm, I guess if I had to choose between the two, I'm kind of more into it, the assembly process and putting things together and, and doing research. I enjoy doing research. Um, but like I said, I think we're all a combination. And um, um, a combination of those things. And I think, you know, but we all kind of have our preference of what we lean toward. And and that's fine, you know. It's, it's fine for you to do it how you want to do it. And, and let me make that clear. If, if you've been watching me for a while, you, you know this is build what you want. I don't care. I will definitely tell you what I think and what my opinion is on something, but I will tell you flat out, it's your model. Do what you want. You don't have to answer to anybody. Um, so, you know, but realize if you're, if you're um, going into a competitive situation where your work is going to be judged against a set of standards, then if you're going to walk into that ball field, you need to play by those rules. Um, and that's that's just a life thing, right? I mean, that's true anywhere. You don't get to do what you want to do. That's not the way the world works. Don't get me started. <laughs> okay. Um, so let's get into detail and shape and accuracy and all this stuff. So I don't really like the term rivet counter. I'm, I'm not real big into um, using demeaning labels. And yeah, maybe you could say rivet counter isn't necessarily demeaning, but I think it comes off that way. I, I don't think doing that in any kind of a discussion is helpful. Um, so I try not to do that. I'm not perfect, but I try not to do that. So, um, so I'm going to use the term researcher. And there are different levels of researchers, right? I mean, there's, there's different things. I will tell you that for me personally, there are certain subjects that I really get into that are, that are important enough to me that I do the research and I want to do things and, and make things right. And there are other subjects I don't care. I'm just putting it together and I'm going to paint it and I'm going to put it on the shelf. It looks cool. I don't care if it's exactly right or not. You're never going to get anything exactly right. You're taking a full size object. You're shrinking it down. You have to make adjustments. There are compromises to be made. So let's just get out of that out there in front right now. There are compromises to be made when you shrink things. It's just the way it is. Okay? So I'm not getting anything cleaned up here, but that's okay. Um, so now, so if we, if we admit that and we go from there, um, you know, we... Where do I go now? So, so let me back up a little bit. Okay, a perfect example of this is, um, or a person who made a real good example of this, I guess, like Shep Payne. Shep Payne had this idea, and I don't remember his exact words, but it was in his um, diorama book. 
that I have around here somewhere. Um, and basically, the, the, the gist of the idea was you only need as much detail as you need. The rest of it's just a waste of time. Is pretty much was pretty much his his um, mantra, I guess. He didn't um, he wasn't necessarily a super detailer. He was he was into doing as much that would be visible at viewing distance, and that was it. Um, Shit paint's not a god. Shit paint's not infallible. You can do what you want. Um, there are many, 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 many people out there that are into finishing and detailing areas that cannot be seen. And they'll tell you it's for practice. They know it's there. Whatever their thing is, that's fine. I'm not that guy. I don't do that. Sorry, alarm. Um, I don't do that. I got plenty of stuff to build. I don't need to spend stuff on, spend time on stuff that um, I don't need to spend time on. I don't. And um, as far as practice goes, you know, you get proud. The more you build, the better you get. The more you airbrush, the better you get. Um, you can't. And 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 the the more time you take off, the more your skills fade. <laughs> It's just life. It's just the way it is, right? You know, you, 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 uh, I always, I'm always taken aback when I run across somebody that's like, that, that picks up some kid or something on, and it's this, this, they have this real emotional attachment to this thing. It's important to them for some reason. It's important to them that they get it exactly right. And then they turn around and say, I haven't touched a model in 25 years. Okay. Dude, or do that? I I don't know. I don't know what to say. You know, unless you're a body man or a painter or a, you know, you're the chances of you pulling off a near perfect build. There are no perfect builds, but the chances of you pulling off a near perfect build after not touching anything in 25 years is pretty slim. Um, not impossible, but pretty slim. And there are a lot of us out here that have been doing this on a pretty regular basis for a long time um, that, well, I don't know. I don't want to say it couldn't do a perfect build, but um, or near a perfect build, but we just don't care that much, I guess. <laughs> right? I mean, um, so yeah, you know, it all depends on what your motivations are, obviously. But, um, so, yeah, so there's no perfect model. And, and that's for a few reasons. Talking about detail and whatnot and kits and shape discrepancies and stuff. Um, there's various things to take into account here. There's, um, for one thing, there's copyright. And um, I don't know what the exact percentages are or whatever, but, you know, if everybody, if you had 10 different manufacturers and they were all, and they all put out a perfect kit, Details are perfect, dimensions dimensionally perfect, blah, 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 blah. There would be lawsuits all over the place for copyright infringement. It just would. Um, so what I'm going to suggest is that manufacturers can't make something exact. You're, you're always going to have anomalies between kits from different manufacturers, and the anomalies are going to be different because... Of copyright issues I don't know that that's true I'm not a lawyer I don't work at the copyright office but just in my general understanding of the way the world works this is an issue um, we could go back to the monogram Ravel b17 fiasco back in the you know the late 70s um, where monogram 
basically called Ravel out and said, hey, this thing's a little too close to our B-17G kit, and next time we're going to sue you. Um, so, you know, that's definitely an issue, and, and you can't... Uh, Oh, what am I thinking now? ICM, some of the ICM kits, like the Mustangs versus the Tamiya kits, they're really, 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 really close. Um, but they're not exact. And somewhere I heard the the idea that it was a 10% of the parts had to be different. And what different means, I'm not really sure. Um, so just because of that, I don't see how you're going to end up with an absolutely perfect shaped kit as far as shape wise um, there's just you know there's legal problems not only that um, we're dealing with injection molded plastic it's malleable right and not only is it malleable but nowadays when we're popping it out of the mold when it's hot and it's super thin and all these other things that we're dealing with that we weren't dealing with 40 years ago um, even if the mold was perfect, I don't know that you could, by the time it got popped out and thrown in a box, it's already deformed, right? I mean, so I don't know. I'm not an injection molded per, molding person. I've never done injection molding. But I'm just telling you what I think. Um, but I think the copyright thing is, is a big, big, big deal. Um, you know, there are also instances when the information is just not available. Um, there And there are instances where um, you have things like the Lindbergh kit, for example, where, you know, these molds are made in the 50s. Um, I, have, I have some in my stash that, well, I have at least one. No, I have a couple of the X-Planes that they did um, because there, there's nothing else out there. Um, they have shape issues, they have scale issues, they have very little detail, um, they don't necessarily fit great. Um, they're the only game in town. And, and some of us, you know, for, for a lot of us, this is a, a nostalgia thing for us and, and it's a, it's a <clears throat> ties us back to our childhood, the things that we build. And, and that's kind of where where I get tied back to monogram. And it's not um, because I'm building things that I necessarily built when I was a kid. I'm building the things now that I couldn't afford when I was a kid. <laughs> to a much better, um, to a much better uh, degree of craftsmanship, too. But that's a side note. So I would say um, research is absolutely a needed thing. Um, it's perfectly fine to have the information and the knowledge and to share the knowledge. Um, but the idea that there will ever be a perfect injection molded model kit I think is a fantasy and and I don't see how it would it, it could or would happen um, you know as I said first of all you're shrinking the thing down second of all there's copyright legal issues third of all you're dealing with a malleable um, substance there's just there's too many there's too many places to screw it up <laughs> And, and I just don't see how that's going to go. Anyway, um, so yeah, I you know for me, I'm with Chef Payne. You only need as much detail as as would be seen from viewing distance. Um, and I'm not I'm not a I'm not the guy that's doing the insides of whatever the. When I had that Trumpeter FW200 with all the interior detail, of fuel tanks and stuff inside, what a waste of time. Absolute waste of time. And I will tell anybody that buys that kit, just throw all that stuff away. Anything behind the cockpit, get rid of it. 
you don't even need to put the instrument panel in because you can't see it. There's no point. Just do the floor, the back wall, the seats. You're good. You know, control columns. That's it. That's it. You're done. You don't need any of the rest of the crap that's inside of there. <laughs> but moving on. Colors. Oh, boy. Color research. I kind of alluded to color when I first started here, but... Um, there are so many things that influence the way colors are reproduced in photographs and on monitors and <coughs> all kinds of things. Um, and, you know, I've, I've done a bit of photography in my time. I worked in a photo lab. I did restorations. Um, I converted, I can't tell you how many um, photographic prints and negatives to digital over the years. And um, there's so, so, so many things that affect the way colors come out in any kind of a presentation format. So the biggest thing I will say up front is there's no such thing as an exact replication <laughs> of a color. Um, and that's just because of what it is. I mean, there's, there's, you know, you have everything from film type to lighting to temperature when this film was developed. I mean, we don't have that problem with digital, but we're talking World War II. Um, film type, um, filters, you know, it was very common with black and white film to use a red filter to boost the contrast. Well, what does a red filter do to red? It filters it out. <laughs> right? So, you know, that's why you'll see like um, post-47 photographs of aircraft where it looks like um, it's a World War II aircraft because there's no red stripe in the national insignia. Well, it's there, but the filter filtered it out. Um, so... You know, camera settings, exposure time, um, the way it was developed, the temperature it was developed at, the the, uh, the mixing of the, the developer, um, and if you're working off a of print, um, again, how the print was done, how long it was exposed, what type of paper was used. There's 10,000 places where it can get mixed up. Secondly, um, the so taking that, okay, most of what we're going to get are um, black and white photos, right? There's some really good colorizations out there, but the thing you need to realize is that those colorizations are done based on um, knowns, okay? You have things that you know are correct and that you can um, put in, you know, that you can, you can, um, I'm going to try and get something done while I'm talking, that you can, um, use as a base. Um, and and I say no is correct, but you can get close. You know, there's so many variations in uniform colors and, and tones and whatnot. Um, but there's a lot of stuff that, they're, that you're just guessing. Right? You're just guessing. And that's, that's, that's there's always going to be that way, and there's not a whole lot you can do about it. 
Um, so if you take that, um, well, and you go into the color photographs, I mean, you really kind of have a lot of the same issues with color photographs. Now, the thing about color photographs is, yeah, you can try and match them to paint samples and stuff, but again, you know, you're coming into that area where the paint samples um, could be off. And, yeah, I mean, colors is just... I don't mean to sound like it's impossible to get it right, but it's, you're just going to have to go with what you're going to go with and live with it, in all honesty. Um, I mean, you can certainly, you know, B-17s are a great example. You can look at a B-17 interior and there's zinc chromic yellow, there's zinc chromic green, there's dull dark green, and there's aluminum depending on whether it's an F or a G or a D or an E or, or a C, um, you know, is going to tell you whether there's corrosion protection inside the fuselage or not. And it might have um, sound deadening materials. And so there's all of this stuff. Um, you know, I mean, I get it. You know, zinc chroma, yeah, it's it's for corrosion control and whatnot. Um, and that's a great thing. But on the other hand, you have to realize they weren't super worried on some of the stuff about corrosion control in most areas because it wasn't built, you know, it's not going to last forever. Um, it's not like today where we're trying to preserve these aircraft and stuff. And so we're really... Um, you know, trying to keep them together so cor corrosion control and whatnot's a big deal. Um, so anyway, um, colors is really, 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 really crazy. I don't think um, in most cases you can go too terribly wrong as long as you're close, right? But... Um, you know, don't just take any, you can't just take any U.S. World War II aircraft and take zinc chrome and yellow and paint the whole interior of everything zinc chrome and yellow and call it good because that's not right. <laughs> it didn't happen. Um, so, do your research, get it close, and, and go from there. That's really the best thing you can do, you know, and you have to... Um, and we're talking, you know, factory stuff here. We're not talking stuff that was done out in the field. Um, out in the field, anything could happen, honestly. Um, you know, you look at like F-14s and stuff from the 80s and whatnot and, and how patchy and stuff they were. Well, you know, you're at sea. Corrosion control is a big deal. And, and they're just... You know, and they got spray cans, and they're patch patch painting these things with spray cans. I mean, it's just you know. So yeah, of course it's gonna be all over the place. Um, but uh, you know, as far as getting all wrapped up in like a late war German BF one hundred nine camouflage colors, don't lose any sleep over it, man. Trust me, I did. <laughs> it's not worth it. <laughs> it's really not worth it. So, hey, after all that, you know what I'm going to tell you? Do what you want. It's your model. Build it the way you want. Right? And, uh, yeah, I think I'm done talking. That's enough yapping. Contest. Shutterace at shutterace.com. Um... Send me a photo of your latest completed build. We'll get you in the drawing for that P61. Shutterace at shutterace.com. Hey, that's it. Have a great day. Take care of the people you love. We'll see you next time. Hey, thanks for watching. Please hit the like, subscribe, ring the bell if you so please. Come on over, visit us at shutterace.com. And most of all, take care of the people you love. Bye now.